Hello and welcome to Raw. I'm Matt. And I'm Alex. And if you're wondering who these creepy crawlies are, they're hissing cockroaches. They're actually one of over 3,500 species of cockroach that exist throughout the world. And yours is a bit busy. <laughs> uh, they actually get their name because they have this ability to hiss. And they do that by passing air through pores inside their tummy. I guess for us it would be a bit like farting. And if you think from their size that they eat a lot, you'd be wrong because they can go for a whole month without eating anything. Thing, which is pretty impressive. Ooh, I'd rather them than me. But uh, we'll be catching up with these fellas over the course of the series. But in the meantime, what? Here's what's coming up on the rest of the programme. Matt's going to grab some DNA off a tiger, if he'll let him. Whoa. <laughs> My heart nearly stopped then. Ooh. I've heard that there's a cheeky chappy who's always up for a tussle at the gorilla house. He's quite rough, isn't he? I see you've got a few scratches there. Yeah, he's very, very strong. And the rhinos are ready to rumble. Come on, boys. Now, our first story concerns a young female drill who is seriously ill. What's a drill, you ask? Well, it's a very rare type of monkey, a distant cousin to the baboon and mandrill who typically lives in the rainforests of Africa. The drill are facing extinction, not only because of the destruction of their natural habitat, but also because people hunt them for meat. There are only 3,000 drills left in the wild, which means that the family here is very special. Simon Jeffrey, the head of the primate section, is so worried about Abuya, the young female, that he's called in local vet Jane Hopper. Um, one of the drill uh, baboons, Abuya, a female, um, Simon noticed yesterday that she has a lump about here on her face, quite a big lump on her cheek. Um, I came to see her with him. She came right up and we had a really good look at her. Um, and I think it's an abscess associated with one of her teeth. Um, it's quite a common thing to see in animals. Um, you can see it in, in monkeys and primates. Um, so today we're going to knock her out, have a look at the lump, see how our teeth are looking. And if it is indeed caused by a tooth, we may need to remove um, that tooth from her. Our main sort of worry is when we have to knock any animal out. The um, uh, biggest thing here, of course, is that we're knocking out an incredibly rare animal that we don't have many of, so if anything did go wrong, it's a, it's a big deal. Abuya has been sectioned off from her family while the vet readies herself for the procedure. Drill, like all monkeys, live in close-knit family troops, and Abuya's unhappy about being separated from the others. She's a little bit stressed, as you, you can expect. Um, she's on her own, she's not quite sure what's happening, so, um, yeah, she's a little bit stressed at the moment. Sedating any animal is always a risky procedure, let alone an animal as precious as a booyah. Since she's the youngest female in the group, the keepers are counting on her to start her own family one day. But for the moment, Abuya is still her father's daughter. Big male Gorby is angry that the keepers have taken her away. He doesn't know what's happened to Abuya, and he's pacing with frustration. This behavior is normal, but it could get far worse. He's, he's obviously getting angry. He's, he knows his family's under threat. Um, so he's, he's doing his job. It's still just instinctive to protect his, his family. He's, he could do some serious damage. I mean, they have uh, up to two inch canines, and that's just pure muscle and testosterone. It's, it could be messy. <laughs> Simon and Jane catch Abuya in a special cage to inject her with the drugs that will knock her out. Abuya doesn't like getting injections any more than you do, and she's nervous. Jane and Simon are making short work of it to ease any pain. With the injection given, there's nothing to do but wait. It's a tense moment for Abuya, Jane the vet, and Simon. We'll be back later to find out how things are going. Here at Port Lim, they've done their best to turn rural Kent into the African savanna. Sounds mad? Well, you wouldn't think so to see it. They've got giraffes, zebras, wildebeest, you name it. The animals here have over 100 acres to roam in. There's plenty for them to eat, and best of all, there are no predators like lions to eat them. It's a bit like a five-star holiday resort, really. This morning, we're off to help the keepers with the black rhino. 
This is head of section Paul and his deputy Nick. Hi guys. Hello. How can we help? Well, um, if Matt goes with Paul uh, up to the gate there to let the rhinos out, and if you'd like to come with me, and we'll okay. put some food out. Where are we going to put the food then? There's a, um, a flat area just over there, just below the um, sort of raceway, and we'll put the food out there. Okay. And, I mean, presumably they're on the reserve, they've got loads of stuff that they can eat out here. Why do we need to give them food as well? Well, it's just to um, make sure they get all the nutrients they need, make sure they get enough food, because we don't necessarily know how much they are eating. And also, it keeps them here for a little while, just so they get used to the whole sort of area again. Okay. You know? So shall I just tip this in a just, line then, Nick? Just tip it down like that. Oh, it looks like they've got a lot to eat here. Yeah. Some really interesting bit of carrots, celery, and some bananas and apples. How do they get on with the other animals here? Um, generally okay, a lot better than um, we kind of thought. I have met on food piles um, before and had a couple of little sort of instances, but um, generally not, not too bad. Um, they've met an eland and they've met um, a wildebeest and come to come to blows, but um, not too bad. And what about, do they get on well with each other? Yeah, they do. They're good friends. OK, Nick, the food's out, so what do we do now? Well, as, it, as the rhinos are fairly dangerous, um, what we'll do, we'll, um, we'll go to the back of the trailer, um, give them a shout, and um, then they can let them go. Matt, Paul, ready? Yeah, OK, cheers, okay. Nick. OK. OK, Paul, here are the boys, ready and raring to go. Yeah. Uh, who, who's who? Right, the one on the left here is Zambezi, yes. and this is Manyara. They're and both, how old are they? Both about four years old, oh, yeah. so they're still quite young. Something unusual on this is Manyara seems to have a third horn. I thought they only had two horns. Yeah, normally they do. Um, there's been a few Ooh. cases of black rhino in the wild where they've had the third horn. We've had a couple more males with three horns. Right, they're pretty feisty, aren't they? Yeah, they're youngsters, I'm teenagers. I'm assuming we're safe here, obviously. This looks yeah, pretty sturdy. Yeah, just keep the safe distance, because they will reach through the fence when they get a bit excited. Uh, this one had a little charge at the other one just now. Does yeah. that, um, what does that mean? Is this warning they're, them off? They're getting a bit agitated. They're waiting to get out and have their breakfast. Um, not being aggressive, it's just they want out, really. Good idea. Well, let's, uh, let's get them out there. What's the procedure? Right. Unlock the padlock, pull right. the slide, and they go down the race, right, hopefully. So will they be out um, all day, every day? Yeah, they'll be out most days, unless we have to do work out here. Um, yes. And they're out pretty much all day. Right, are we set then? Yeah, I think we are. Come on, boys. Come on, then. Out you come. Do they always go in just whoever's first in the yeah, gate? Yeah, there's there no sort of hierarchy. No particular order. Um, some days they come down and eat on the way down. Yeah. They eat the grass. Um, other days they come out like bullets. They seem pretty keen to get out today, yeah, that's for sure. They want their breakfast. Is it quite unusual to have um, two males together? Yeah, I don't know of any other zoos that keep males together. I mean, we're quite lucky here because we haven't got any females in the facility. Yeah. When they get a bit older, they might start picking up scent from the girls in the park, and we might have a little bit of an aggression build up, but I just think we'll be okay for a few years. Paul, were these two boys born here at yeah, Portland? They were, yeah. We've had, I think it's 27 births, most of them successful since we've been keeping black rhino. 27? So, That's yeah, phenomenal. We're doing pretty well. Um, three have been sent back to the wild in reserves. Two of them have bred since they've been back out there. Really? So it's all going really well. That's There's... really crucial, isn't it? Because they're quite endangered in yeah, the wild. Yeah, they are. Um, and there's plans for sending more out, so it's all good. Well, fantastic success. Well, they are absolutely brilliant. Hey, Alex, well done. They're enjoying their food. Are they fantastic? Aren't they brilliant? They're fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Nick. This is a real treat. No problem. Where do dogs go if they lose their tails? To the Reese tail store. What do you get if you cross a duck with a firework? A firecracker. What do bees chew? Bumblegum. At the monkey house, keeper Simon Jeffrey and vet Jane Hooper have sedated Abuya, a young female drill, in order to take a look at a lump on her face. So far, things are going to plan. The drugs have worked their magic and Abuya is fast asleep. This means that Jane can get on with the examination. Everyone is worried. The drills are very rare animals and they can't afford for anything to go wrong. Jane begins by gently prodding the lump. So she's got a swelling on her face here that Simon noticed yesterday. And when animals get a big abscess on their face like this, it's often associated with a tooth, and we call it a malar abscess. Simon watches on anxiously. 
unlike the male drill, whose canine teeth are nearly as long as that of a tiger or lion, a booyah's teeth are small, just the right size for munching on plants, insects and small animals. Jane isolates the problem tooth and acts quickly. So I'm just investigating this tooth and it may need to come out. It's doing all right, isn't she? A little bit attached still. Big tooth. There's the tooth. So that's good. All the roots are intact. We haven't left any of the tooth behind. That should make her feel a lot better. The tooth comes out cleanly, making it easier for Jane to prevent further infection. The tooth didn't look bad at all, but I just noticed it was a tiny bit loose. And if you look on one edge, I think this edge brown. is just starting to go brown around there. Mm. But other than that, the rest of the teeth are excellent. Okay. So I'm sure that's the cause of the, of the facial abscess. So it would set up an infection that tracked upwards into the bone of the face. And all the infection will be able to now drain out and with a nice course of antibiotics, she'll be as good as new. So she's just having a painkiller and some strong antibiotics. She's need to going, to have, going to need to have a course of antibiotics as well, because she's obviously got a cavity where the tooth was and it's quite infected already. Excellent. But it is critical she brings a booyah around soon. Her body won't take more time under sedation. Okay. It will take time for a booyah to wake from the drugs. Will she make a full recovery? We'll just have to wait and see. The African experience at the park is home to more than giraffes, zebras and black rhinos. It's also the place where you can get up close to one of the strangest birds you could ever hope to meet, the ostrich. A bird with the dubious honour of having an eye that's bigger than its brain. I've gathered together a team of inquisitive children and we're off to meet Keeper Rob Gordon. I hope he's done his homework. You know they're the necks? Mm -hmm. um, are they like giraffes? With their necks. They're a little bit like giraffes with their long necks, except for you can see there they're kind of eating a little bit down off the floor. Whereas giraffes use their long necks to eat really, really high. These guys can use their long necks to, to eat at lots of different things around them. So uh, that's why they have long necks. It's a little bit different. How long are their beaks? How long are their beaks? You can see their beaks, they're only about two or three inches long, quite short, um, which works well for picking up little bits of grass and seeds, which is what they like to eat the most. Is it true they bury their head in the sand? And that's a good question. Actually, it's not, no. They don't actually bury their heads at all. But what happens is, uh, if you look at one from a long, long way away, because they hold their head down sometimes, it can look like they've put it in the ground. So that's where that came from. Interesting. Jamie, what's the difference between the grey one and the black one? Well, that's a good question there. as well. The, the grey one is the female, so that's the girl one, and the black one is the boy. So they're very, very easy to tell apart. And uh, you can see that sometimes the black ones also have much redder beaks and legs as well, so it's another good way of telling them apart too. Do they knock people over with their wings? Do they knock people over? Well, not normally, not with their wings. Um, they do hold them out and throw them around a bit like this to sort of make themselves look bigger and scarier. But um, no, they don't knock people over or anything like that. They're not too bad. Are they dangerous? Yeah, they can be quite dangerous. Uh, they've got big, big legs, as you can see. They can give quite a powerful kick. They've got a pretty big... Uh, sort of claw on the front, Yes, that's they? right. They have got a, like a claw, um, sort of cross between a claw and a toenail, really. And uh, with that claw, they've uh, been known to break bones and they can even rip uh, stomachs open if they do kick quite hard. So it is quite scary, but um, they're all right normally. They're not too bad, but um, they can do it if they want to. How fast can they run? Well, ostriches can run very, very fast, about 45 miles an hour, which is quite quick indeed. It's about the speed a lot of cars go through towns at that sort of speed. Um, but they can't do it for too long because they get quite tired, so only for about half an hour. But it is very, very fast. How can they balance on just the one big toe and some little toe? See the, the big toes there? They, they're very, very long at the front, and that supports all their weight quite nicely. And the way they are, you can see they've got a lot behind their legs as well as in front of their legs, and that stops them from tipping over in, in one different direction. Can they fly just like chickens, just a little bit? No, these guys can't fly at all, actually. Um, their wings are much, much shorter than that of chicken wings, sort of, comparatively. Um, and they don't use them for flying at all. Um, they actually just use them for sort of displaying and things like that. Can they swim? 
No, they can't swim. Terrible swimmers. Um, they don't even really like very wet ground. When anything's a bit muddy, they don't like that either. Dry, hard ground is what they prefer, so. How big is an ostrich egg? Well, ostrich eggs are very, very big. In fact, they're the biggest out of all oh. eggs. Uh, and they're about the size of 24 chicken eggs, about six inches long, and they weigh over a kilo, so they're very, very big. Uh, and if you were to boil one for your breakfast, you'd have to get up very, very early, because they take two hours to boil. So uh, you'd have to get up extremely early to get it for your breakfast time. Brilliant ostrich facts. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Tigers are some of the most popular animals at the park. Typically, they come from Asia, but most of these have been born and bred here. They're used to seeing people, especially their keepers, but that doesn't make them tame. I've come over to the tiger enclosure to meet head of section Jim Vassy, and he's got me worried because he asked me to bring this, a toothbrush. Hiya, Jim. Oh, that, all right. Now, seriously, I'm not brushing the teeth of this enormous tiger, am I? No, not today. We'll keep that for another day. Ooh, that's the, day the day we need to take a hair sample. Oh, yeah, why is that? Well, we've got a student who's um, doing some DNA testing on tigers. Uh -huh. So we can find out, you know, exactly, you know, whose family they belong to and so on and so on. And to find out how pure they are. I see. I see you've so, got a big bucket of meat there. Yeah, this is just to keep him occupied while we uh, get oh, some yeah. hair samples. Can I give him a little piece? Yeah, of course you can. That'd be fantastic. And. He's, uh, he's what kind of tiger did you this say? This is an Indian tiger. Indian tiger. He's amazing. He's an enormous size. How old is he? He's 18. So he's, he's, he is getting on in, in years, but uh, like I say, we still need to take a hair sample. So okay. if you want to stick your toothbrush right. in and try and get a hair sample okay, of him. you distract him. him. Oh, he's got his eye on that. <laughs> oh, not so sure, not so sure. No, it's, it's something that obviously they're oh, not Oh, there we go, to. there we go. Let's give him a good that old tickle. Good. He that likes that, good. he likes that. So why do you think testing is so important? Yeah, look, I've got a good bit of hair there. Yeah. Well, I mean, f f for two reasons, really. One is so that we know then just how pure the tigers are in zoos. Yes. Because obviously, you know, if we do ever breed them and return them to the wild, the last thing you want is a tiger going back that's got some Siberian blood in him or right. some Martian. Yep. So we need them as pure as possible to send them back to the native country, as it were. So have you got a big breeding programme here? Well, we did have. I mean, obviously, you know, he's too old now, and so he's in retirement, basically. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, the idea is that, uh, you know, we will uh, breed Indian tigers again, along with Siberian. So try with another one. You know, and try and put them back in protected that. areas in the wild. Yeah. So, and, and they are endangered in the wild, aren't they? Yeah, unfortunately, poaching is the biggest... Oh, look at those yeah. teeth. <laughs> Yeah, poaching is the biggest um, I'll try threat a bit more fur, I? for um, for tigers. Yeah, what, I and mean, why do they poach them? Well, is it for uh, his amazing fur. No, it's not just for the fur. I mean, though they have got an amazing coat, you know, because obviously. Oh. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> My heart nearly stopped then. Uh, Woo! We are you know, so close. I'm sorry, yeah. I just can't believe I'm no. so close to this tiger. You know, obviously they have got an amazing coat, and unfortunately there are a lot of people out there who would like to wear fur coats, yeah. but obviously they look better on the cat. That's tragic, but, isn't um, it? it? It's mainly, you know, for the so-called Chinese medicine market, is the is one of the biggest threats for tigers. Oh, no. Yeah, they use, they they use, use body parts. parts. medicine? Yeah, well, oh, I mean, whether tragic. it works or not, it's, it's something that I suppose us in the West will probably never know because they've been doing it for thousands of years. Yeah. But obviously because of those thousands of years, there aren't many tigers left. Well, Good it looks chunk. like he's, uh, chunk, he's chunk. had enough of his brushing. What an amazing treat to see him so close. Let's hope this uh, research helps the species, Jim. Yeah, Thank right. you very, very no, much. No problem, Matt. Well done, Chokes. Well done, boy. Good well boy. Done. Good boy. Let's have a nice treat, yeah? This is the largest mammal that roams the face of the Earth. It uses its enormous ears to control its body temperature, and its tongue alone weighs more than a three-year-old child. This is the biggest animal of the lot, the African elephant. Head elephant keeper Dave Magna has devoted his life to looking after African elephants and thinks they are the best thing in the world. Once you work with elephants for a long time, you're hooked on them. I don't think there's a, an hour goes past where you're not thinking about them, especially when your day's off, because it's just in you. African elephants originate from Africa. 
They are found across the central and southern parts of this vast continent and can live in areas as diverse as rainforests and deserts. Elephants have been ferociously hunted for their ivory tusks, which are used to make ornaments. Poachers could earn a year's wages by killing just one elephant, and in the last 30 years, a million were killed. Today, though, elephants have a much better protection against poachers, and their future is much brighter. Looking after the biggest animal in the world also involves the biggest mucking out job in the world. And with 13 elephants that Dave looks after producing more than two tons of poo a day, it's really hard work. Well, 13 elephants, they poo a lot. In fact, all they do is eat and poo. They make you work. That's enjoyable, but it's all part of the job. Breakfast for you may be a bowl of cereal, but breakfast for a herd of elephants is 240 beetroot, 180 carrots, 120 parsnips, 130 apples. Add to that a few sacks of Swedes, bananas and cabbages and you've got a jumbo breakfast served in a dumper truck. There is a lot of food, but um, considering it's going to go out for 10 elephants, it doesn't last very long once it's spread out. It isn't really that much. With 2,000 kilos of poo mucked out and 1,000 kilos of food put in, it's time for the elephants to come out for the day. But all the hard work is worth it for Dave. I think I'm accepted by the group as a member of their family, especially with the bull. I mean, me and him have got uh, quite a rapport with each other. I don't know, it's just a bond, which to me is fantastic, especially being able to walk up to something that size. Not many people are fortunate enough to do this. I can never see myself doing anything else. I'm in the tapir house with Keeper Carl Parker and the cuddliest little baby tapir called Tenji. She's great, isn't she, Carl? Yeah, she's truly wonderful. And uh, she seems completely contented with yeah, us. Uh, yeah, no, they all, cuddle. they all love their tickles and their, and their scratch and their cuddles, yeah. Now, you've known her since, well, the day she was born, haven't you? Yes, oh, yes, yeah. And has she developed a um, specific sort of character since then? What yeah, sort of oh, girl is she? They're, um, all the tapirs here are very much individual, but, uh, yeah, she's... Uh, Quite a feisty little one, so she she's quite pl very playful. So um, yeah, she'll sit here for hours as long as as long as you keep scratching her. <laughs> Fantastic. And in the wild, I mean, do they do they groom each other? Is, no. Do they get this kind of contact? No. Between... Um, it's sort of a, a natural reaction um, due to when when when, um, when the baby's small mm. and the mother's standing up. What what they do um, is they they rub along the side of their mum, and that's a, that's to encourage her to lay down. Uh -huh. For feeding, oh, so then of course mum lays down, and then the baby starts to feed. Oh. So it's, it's all it's all a natural reaction. So they carry on. So you can still do this with uh, with, with the adults. Oh yes, yeah. It, uh, they all it's uh, part of our conditioning that we do here. So um, they all get scratched down, and that way we can all check their toes and their feet, and and um, and the vet can come in, and, and if she needs to take any blood, if one's not very well, she can just take blood without having to sedate them or Brilliant. or anything like that. Well, she seems incredibly healthy now. I, I, I'm completely besotted with her. I think I'd like to swap jobs with you, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we'll have plenty more cute and cuddly animals in the rest of the programme. What's making this drill monkey so furious? Has the vet managed to save his daughter, Abuya? Matt's just hoping to escape from the discovery zone with his life. Well, well you're grabbing it right by its sting now, aren't you? And look out, the honey badgers are spoiling for a fight with the big cat team. Earlier, Abuya the drill monkey was knocked out to discover the cause of the swelling on her face. It turned out she was suffering from a nasty tooth abscess. 
Jane Hooper, the vet, found the infected tooth just in time to prevent the spread of the infection. It's been quite a morning. Jane had never treated an animal as rare as a drill before, and a booyah had never been sedated, so no one was really sure what might happen. Well, it's gone really well today. I mean, um, we've taken the tooth out without any problems. She's come round incredibly well. As you can see, she's just starting to wake up now. Her eyes are starting to blink and her head's slightly off the floor. So it's gone really well. Yeah, she'll be in here until she comes round properly, until she can stand on her own sort of four feet and, and get around a little bit more. And then we'll actually start putting her back into the group. There can always be problems with any anaesthetic on any animal. Um, I hadn't actually anaesthetised a drill before, though I've anaesthetised a lot of different types of monkeys, so I wasn't too worried, but uh, she went to sleep very nicely. She stayed asleep with the procedure, and now she's busy waking up brilliantly, so I'm very, very pleased. So a buoy has come through like a trooper, and everyone is relieved. The only person who hasn't recovered from the events of the day is a booyah's father, Gorby. He'd worked himself into a right old state because he thought the team were hurting a booyah. And let me tell you, he's got quite a temper on him. He was so furious that he even tried to storm the operating room to rescue her. He's annoyed with us and he really doesn't want us in here <laughs> because we've been dealing with his daughters. He's a very protective dad. After a few hours, Simon's pleased enough with Abuya's progress to let her back into the enclosure. The whole day's gone really, really well. I mean, uh, since the operation and everything, she's come round incredibly well. Um, she um, was let out of the crush, and then we could see that she was moving very well, and we let her straight out here. She went straight back to her family and was cuddled up, so, I mean, that's perfect, really. Um, we've given her a scatter feed, watched her come and eat, so there's no problems with her eating in any way, shape or form. So you can't ask for a more perfect day in any way. Now that Abuya's back in the fold, Dad Gorby is looking more chilled. He's even decided to forgive Simon. And as for Abuya, she's looking better already. Her speedy recovery is a sure sign that this family of drill will continue to thrive. I'm over at the gorilla enclosure with keeper Lorna Wanless and the cheekiest and most playful of the new gorillas here at the park. Lorna, who's this? Uh, this is Barney. Um, hey, Barney. He's, oh, he'll be three shortly. Um, and unfortunately, he's in with the, the old ladies. Uh, oh, um, right. He was a bit of a surprise a couple of years ago. Because um, one of the old ladies is his mum, is that right? That's right, yeah. So he hasn't got any other brothers or sisters to play with, so every time we walk past, she used to a bit sort of play with me. He wants know? to play with you. And is there any reason why you separate them? Could you combine them with any of the other groups here, for example? Um, not really. This is sort of a separate group in, in itself, so... They don't yeah. combine well if you try to introduce groups together. Not really, because there's one silverback per, per oh, group. Of course, so... yes, one big male. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is quite... Um, you said it was a family group, but it's quite a small group. Is this the sort of size you'd see in the wild, or would they be a bigger group in the wild? Um, this is quite a oh. small group, um, just because it's the old pensioners, so they're quite old. Yeah. And what sort of things do you do to play with him? Um, Tickle his uh, wrists, Goodbye. he's very tickly wrists, his armpits and just the usual sort of things that, you know, humans are, are really. And is it, what sort of character is he? Um, he's got a very big character for such a little thing and it, <laughs> actually he's really strong if you, um, if you sort of your hands. see how strong he is when he sort of pulls you through. But, um, Here he comes. And how old is he now, did you say? Uh, he's coming up to three. <laughs> But he's tried to, obviously, you can see, drag, <laughs> drag you through, but he's... Oh, no. uh, he has got some power in those arms for a three-year-old, hasn't he? He has. <laughs> he's quite rough, isn't he? I see you've got a few scratches there. Yeah, he's very, very strong, very strong. But he's very ticklish, and um, his palms here and under his armpits, but, yeah, he's got nails, as you can see. My arm is a bit covered in... Oh, look at yeah. that! <laughs> uh, it's a small but, price to pay to well, play, play with such it. a super little chap. So you come down to do this, um... Every day, do you, or whenever you get an opportunity, just give him a bit of company, I guess. Well, every time you walk past, he's sort of, um, you know, play with me, play with me. So we just sort of spend a few minutes just um, chasing him up and down. And he normally is on the platform, running up and down, doing break dancing. And he just loves yeah. the contact, doesn't he? Yeah. And yeah. you've known him all his life, I suppose. Yes, since he was born, yeah. yeah. So you must and have a very special bond with this little chap. Yeah, especially because when he was uh, five months old, he was quite poorly, so I had him at home for a week, so... Oh, he's, did you? He's quite special for me, yeah. Oh. 
You are fantastic, aren't you? <laughs> Think he's a bit camera shy. Oh, here he goes. Here he goes. Come on, come on. Here we can... oh. <laughs> You're going to hear him laughing. He's fantastic. Well, it's fantastic to meet you, Barney. I'm going to stay here and play with Barney, I think. Come on, come on. Good boy. The serval cat is one of the most gorgeous cats in the park. They're typically more active at twilight than in the full heat of the day, but I've been assured by keeper Alan Keeling that Melindy is wide awake and expecting my visit. Alan, she's gorgeous, and I understand that she's particularly special to you, so tell us a bit about that. Yeah, um, when she was two weeks old, um, she sustained quite a bad injury in the cage. Um, what happened to her? Well, we're having to make an assumption that maybe uh, when her mum was carrying her, it was just a, a slight mistake and she got a scratch mm. um, on her chest area. Um, problem was that every time mum went to clean it, licking it, she, she, she tore it open more and more and more, so it, it was actually quite a serious injury. So, mm. because she needed um, antibiotic injections daily and she needed cream putting on it, we actually had to take her out of the cage to do this. So. And I understand you then hand reared her? Yeah, she's, uh, she's lived with me for about three months at home and bringing her back to work every day. And, um, Wonderful. And so if she hadn't been hand reared, could we get as close to her as we are now? Uh, no. <laughs> um, basically, yeah, she's still got all her wild instincts, but because mm. she's been in such close contact with people all her life, she's got absolutely no fear of us. She's got no reason to. Um, mm. So basically, yeah, if she was still a wild animal, um, She'd probably scratch you to pieces by now. Yeah. Would she? <laughs> well, it's just amazing to be this close to her. Now, I understand you've got some lunch for her. Yeah, we have. Oh. Um, <laughs> she's going to have some rats today. Oh, is and, she? Um, okay. I thought perhaps it could be your job today to feed oh, her. Oh, rats again. Just my luck. Um, <laughs> okay, they're right here. Yeah. <laughs> so, what's the best way of doing this? Right, you, oh. can, um, <laughs> you can hold it up that for her. lost its tail. <laughs> make a jump, or you can uh, pull them along the ground. Um, if you try with the other one, she okay. may well come running back for it. And how do they hunt in the wild, Alan? Well, they'd be hunting in um, long grass or reeds generally, or around lakes. So, basically, as you can see, she's got incredibly large ears to uh, pinpoint any sounds that she'll hear in the grass, because she wouldn't be able to see it. So, she pinpoints exactly where the prey items are, whether it's above ground or below ground even. And, uh, and she uh, pounces. Just like that. <laughs> Have to yep. be quite careful of those claws. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just keep well, your Alan, fingers out of the way. It's just then. amazing to meet her. Thank you so much for introducing us to her. I think if it's all right with you, I might stick around and play with her some more. There you go then. Oh, <laughs> delightful. <laughs> At two years old, Melindy's full grown, but you'd never know it. All she ever wants to do is play. Play. She wants to play. <laughs> Give it here! Phew! Time for a snack! <laughs> What's a snake's favourite subject? History. Hmm? What do you get if you cross a cat and a lemon? A sourpuss. Why can't you play games in the jungle? Because there's too many cheaters. So what do you think is the fiercest, most vicious and aggressive animal at the park? If you think it's the virtually armour-plated black rhino, then you're wrong. And if you think it's the man-eating Siberian tiger, you'd still be wrong. And if you think it's a powerful silverback gorilla, once again, you're wrong. In fact, that honour goes to the tiny honey badger. 
weighing in at only 10 kilos and standing just 30 centimeters tall, you'd be forgiven for thinking these little fellas were harmless. They're not. They're the most aggressive little bullies in the animal kingdom. Honey badgers are feared by all animals with any sense. They eat poisonous snakes and scorpions for breakfast and munch on the prey of bigger carnivores for dinner. Yep, that leopard left its kill rather than get into a fight with a badger. Head cat keeper Jim Vassy has witnessed the extent of these badgers' thuggery firsthand. They once escaped from their enclosure and got into the bear pit, which is next door to them, and uh, the two tigers in there were absolutely petrified, and they climbed to the highest point of their cage and wouldn't come down until we got the honey badgers out, which you think you find very funny because the tiger, 50 times the size, was actually petrified. And the honey badger was basically laughing at them, you know, saying, come down here and, you know, show us what you're made of. So the tiger's a big pussy compared to a honey badger. Sounds like it's best to stay well away. Unfortunately for the cat keepers, that's not an option. Sometimes they have to venture into the badger's lair, and today is one of those days. The honey badger's patch needs strimming, so the whole big cat team has been called in to do it. Keeper Alan Keeling is understandably nervous. I mean, I've heard of a few stories here. One of the keepers who used to work here, he was strimming in one direction, one pops up from a hole in the other direction and grabbed his trouser leg and shoe and, and proceeded to try and drag him back down through a hole. But, I mean, <laughs> so only little, but they're incredibly strong. They've got very, very powerful jaws, which uh, doesn't help when it's coupled with a very aggressive <laughs> attitude. While his men are about to risk life and limb, head of section Jim Vassy has a plan for distracting the badgers, which cunningly keeps him out of the war zone. Well, I've got two very small bones here with a bit of meat on it. I'm going to go up the back there and entice them up there while the boys get in, because we need to turn the fence off, which is obviously an electric fence, so the boys can get in without getting zapped. Alan will be in there with a rake in case one decides to leave its food and come after Ricky or Chris. And so Alan's there as a sort of second defence, as it were. I'm not going in there. <laughs> You're going to be joking. <laughs> They're the mugs. I'm going to go and feed them. <laughs> right, boys, are you ready? Yeah? Okay. It's time to go over the top. The boys had better hope the plan works, because the honey badger is well known for grabbing its prey by anything it can get hold of. <gasps> Crikey! Ready with that rake, Alan? The job we're doing is obviously strimming the stinging nettles and grass down because basically the public can't see. But this is a job that we have to do once a fortnight. It's a job that needs to be done, but with caution. I've, I've, but I've just noticed the females come out of her home with, with, without her food, so I'm assuming she's already eaten it and looking for more, so it, we could, get, could get have a problem in a minute if we're not careful. She just might go hunting towards Chris and Rick and Alan. So, obviously, we don't want that to happen, do we? <laughs> the honey badger is not just aggressive, it's also fearless. It's actually listed in the Guinness Book of Records as being the most fearless animal on the planet. This reputation comes in part from their sweet name. Honey badgers love honey. And you've either got to be nuts or fearless to pick a fight with a hive of bees. When they go raining honey from the, a beehive, they will get stung thousands of times and they just ignore it and they just carry on. Whereas you and I get stung and it, it hurts. Whereas it don't bother them and they just, they just keep going and nothing seems to phase them. Uh-oh, uh here they come. The, the female was going, for, going towards them. <laughs> no worries though, they're in retreat. They come from, obviously, the continent of Africa, so lions are afraid of them, and hyenas, I'll stay clear of them. A lot of the time, it's mainly so that, because a lion, hyena, can't afford to get injured. They keep clear. So where they say the lion is the king of the jungle, nah, nah, honey badger, honey badger rules. <laughs> so there you have it. The honey badger has a well-deserved reputation as being the toughest animal in the park. But I still can't help thinking they look quite cute. All animals look cute. But they're not. <laughs> you know, you couldn't cuddle it. <laughs> Put it that way. Not unless it's asleep. <laughs> I mean, you're welcome to try. 
I think the boys are finished, so I think we'll better go and get them, get them out and put the electric fence back on. With great relief, all the keepers make it out in one piece, but they'll have to do it again in two weeks' time. Meanwhile, we can only hope that 10,000 volts of electric fence keep the wee beasties where they should be. I'm in the discovery zone and I am genuinely nervous because I've come over to meet Keeper Rich Barnes who is moving the Emperor Scorpions by hand. Rich, are you mad? Uh, not mad. Um, it's not really that, that bad. Um, it's kind of a, a misconception that they're as dangerous as people think they are. Really? And you've probably got about as much chance of choking on a Brussels sprout than you have of being stung by one of these guys. Mm, so. Might take my chances with the sprouts, but <laughs> carry on. OK. <laughs> We'll get one out. Whoa, 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 well, you're grabbing it right by its sting now, aren't you? Yeah, um, just so you guys can see, I mean, this <laughs> this is the um, the bulb in which it stings from. Yes. Um, potentially, to stop it stinging you, when you pick them up, you can hold them like that. Um, it doesn't harm them at all, and it just, you know, <laughs> it stops them actually being able to sting you. Um, I try not to do that where possible, try to just ease them onto my hands or pick them up another way. Um, and once you've got them, they usually just sit there. They're not really that bothered about being handled, you know? Rich, it looks to me like he's got sort of two danger areas. He's got yeah. the big long sting at the back and he's also got these two huge claws. Yeah, OK, well, um, if we were small enough for him to eat, then, yeah, he'd, he'd have us in those claws and he'd use us to, that to pin us to the floor while he whacked his, uh, his sting into us. Right. Um, it's one way of actually telling whether a scorpion's really dangerous or not to us. Mm -hmm. um, these are what we call fighting scorpions, forest fighting scorpions. They've got large claws to defend themselves against other scorpions. Um, and quite a small tail in comparison to the size of the claws in the body. Mm -hmm. um, on a, a different type of scorpion that might be more highly venomous, they tend to have quite small claws because um, they don't fight as much and the, the tail tends to be a lot bigger. Right. So it's uh, an immediate, when you see one, you could tell roughly whether it's going to be dangerous or, so or not. So small pincers, big tail, watch out. Yeah. He's a yeah, venomous that's one. That's it, yeah. OK. Now, we've got him out because we're moving him, that's right? That's correct, yeah. OK. And I know you've got a little pot down there, so I'll just grab that. Yeah, you can. Do, and, yeah. Uh, um, so we're putting him there now. Why are we moving him from here? OK, well, these guys don't technically come from the, the sort of dry, deserty, savannah area. They come from uh, the, the tropics and the, the rainforest and stuff. So we're going to move him next door. Okay. Take him off my finger there. Um, we're going to put him and the other two guys in there um, next door into the, uh, the new tank for them. OK, excellent. So we've got two more to do there. Yeah. So there you go. in the wild, what sort of thing would they hunt? You OK, think? yeah. Um, they're... Basically, eat any other kind of invert. They're cannibalistic sometimes as well. Um, you've got to be a bit careful. Um, when we introduced these guys to each other, we had to make sure that um, they're all going to get along. Yeah. And um, the big one that we put in that's not here at the moment, and we had to take out again because he got a little bit aggressive. Yes. And as you can see, this one's got half a leg at the back missing. Oh, my And goodness. Uh, unfortunately, I lost that in in an early duel, uh, but these three have got on really well, so we've left them together. OK, fantastic. Well, let's, um, let's take them to their new home, shall yeah. we? OK. All right. All right, Rich, so this is the tropical area. This is their new home, is it? Yeah, this is where they're going. Excellent. Right, I'll open that up. Thank you very much. They've got an amazing shell, haven't they? They look like they're completely armoured. Yeah, they are. Um, and they also do something quite funky. When we put them in this new tank uh, under the UV black light, they'll shine up a kind of luminous green colour. Oh, wow. Go on, go ahead. OK, we'll just show you how they do that. Put this in there. Whoa! That is so bright. Why do they do that? OK, it's just the chemical compound uh, under their exoskeleton above the sort of layer of skin, and, and for some reason it just shines up this colour. How amazing. And what does exoskeleton mean? It just means they've got the skeleton on the exterior, basically. It's the, it's the wrong way round, so oh, they've yeah. just, uh, yeah, got an outer skeleton. Brilliant. Well, you go ahead okay, and pop yeah, the others in. these guys in there as well. Rich, I think that you may have helped me conquer my fear. I think I may be a new fan of scorpions. Good. They're absolutely amazing creatures. Thank you very, very much. No worries. There you go. Earlier, I spent some time with Melindy, the serval cat. I've never met a cat who liked to play as much as her, but keeper Neville Buck has promised to introduce me to an even more unusual feline. Neville, who's this? This is Louis. He's a fishing cat from Southeast Asia. He's a fishing cat, so does that mean he actually fishes and goes in the water? Oh, absolutely, yeah. He'll be straight in there for his uh, 
Grease tea. Wow. Ooh. Wow, straight in. So it's a complete myth, really, that cats don't like water. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's, there's quite a few species of cats that will, um, yeah, go, up and go in for food without any hesitation. He's sort of scooping the fish out, really, isn't he? Does he sometimes go right under the water? Oh, yeah, I mean, a fish cat will go totally submerge themselves mm. under the water. And, Neville, I understand that you hand-raised Louis. Why was that? Well, basically, when he was three weeks old, I mean, his mum had been doing a, a very good job of, of raising um, both him and his sibling, but at three weeks, she decided, for some unknown reason, to um, take one of the kittens to the water, drowned it, and she actually ate, ate the kitten, so there was a little bit of remains left, um, but we don't know exactly why she did it. And as a precaution, we actually took Louis out and raised him from about three, three weeks old. I mean, we, we figured it was a, a congenital defect with the kitten, and, and that's why she did it. I mean, it was um, just nature's way of making sure that only, only the, um, the fit survive. And presumably in the wild, his mum would teach him how to swim. How did you teach him how to swim? Um, it was actually very, very natural. We didn't so much lead him to the water. He discovered it by himself from early on. I mean, as soon as he discovered the, the cat's water ball, he started playing in there. Then he progressed to a foot spa, um, then to the washing up bowl and kind of paddling in there while you're trying to, trying to wash the dishes. And then, she, then he discovered the bath. Um, he'd just play around in there, and he'd actually come out and gather some toys that he had to play with and, and actually take them back into the bath with him. You know, wow. I think. <laughs> After such a big lunch, you'd never think that Louis would have room for pudding, but Neville has brought along a surprise. He's really desperate he picked, for this. He picked up a, um, a bit of a habit when he was younger. My, my daughter at the time used to put squirty cream on her cornflakes and he suddenly discovered it when he jumped on the table one morning. <laughs> and ever since, he's had a passion for it. And, and tell me... Give a good uh, Have I got a, a good If you yeah. show me how to do it, I don't think I'm doing it the right way. As he's licking it, I can tell his tongue is so rough, isn't it? Yeah. Is that like a domestic cat's tongue? Well, all, all cats' tongues are um, rough like that. I mean, basically, they can, they can lick meat off the bone. A cat without teeth will not necessarily starve. I mean, if you, you, you put foot down for it, even if it can't bite and chew, it can, it can rasp the, uh, the meat from the, the bone or something, so... Mm. And is, is cream good for him? Well, cream is, uh, like everything, it's, um, it's all right in moderation, but uh, not, not good for him, obviously, uh, every day. I mean, it, this is just a treat that he gets once in a okay. while. Well, we'll give him one more squirt then. Um, we, don't want him, we don't want him getting fat. I've heard of the cat that got the cream, but this is too much. How many cats do you know like water and squirty cream? Now, remember earlier in the programme when we met Keeper Paul Beer? He's the guy who I helped let out the rhinos. Well, he knows everything there is to know about black rhinos, and he should do, since he's been looking after these big animals for a long time. Eleven years, in fact. So when he was asked to look after the newest arrivals in the park, he wasn't sure if he was up for it. Oh, he could handle the grumpy rhinos all right, but the prickly personalities of these little guys really worried him. Can you guess what they are? I'll give you a few hints. Paul's new friends are rodents, the same family as rats and mice. They like to eat fruit, plants, even insects, and can grow up to 80 centimetres long. They have very strong claws and could dig up the whole garden if given the chance. OK, this is the final hint, so pay attention. They're covered in sharp quills from head to toe. So what are they? Don't worry if you can't guess, because Keeper Paul is happy to do the introductions. Yeah, these are the crusty porcupines. Um, being the head rhino keeper, I didn't expect to be looking after porcupines. Um, basically, at the moment, we're temporarily housing them in the rhino building here, ready for when the primate section have got their new enclosure ready for them for the move in a couple of weeks. But they've been here over winter, so they've got a nice indoor area, the outdoor yard that they can go in and out. And, uh, yeah, so it's settled in quite well. There's a breeding female, a breeding male, and two of unknown sex, two younger ones. Um, they were, they were quite nervous when they first turned up, but now you can get meat out of your hand when they're settled indoors and they're quite nice and steady. 
clearly Keeper Paul is doing a great job because these porcupines feel comfortable enough to come out during the day. But in the wild, they wouldn't dare. They would sleep in their burrows all day long and only come out at night. Why so skittish, you ask? Well, this is mainly due to the extraordinary heat of the African plains. But even in the dark, the wild is still a dangerous place. So to protect themselves, porcupines regularly fluff their spikes. Living at the park is pretty cush for Paul's new friends. The temperature is much cooler and they can eat whenever they want. Yeah, they pretty much eat anything. Um, basically herbivores. I mean, they come from Africa. They're the Africa australis subspecies of the crested porcupine. They do a lot of digging. I mean, we're lucky here because this is a solid concrete yard designed for rhinos, so they can't dig out. But we've had to take other precautions and wire up the sides so they don't disappear into the Kent countryside. But even if they did escape, surely they aren't that dangerous. The general defence is they puff themselves out so the quills stick out and they just run backwards. Um, in the wild, I mean, they do it to the big cats and things like that. It causes damage. They've been known to kill leopards with it. It's just a case of keeping out of the way. They're quite easily shed as well. You, you go indoors in the bedroom and you pick up quills and they, they, they replace them quite quickly. Whoa, how mad is that? Porcupines run backwards when in danger. And just look at those quills. The porcupine has over 30,000 of these super hardened hairs. So is Paul in any danger from them? Quills are quite sharp. Um, they could probably penetrate your skin, but you just stay out of the way of them. They also make quite a racket. The noise is the quills on their backs rattling. Um, they can be some nervousness or aggression. They, just, they do it when they're, they're being moved about. and they. They kick up a bit of a stink, but then, like you see now, they've settled down. Let's hear that noise one more time. <laughs> but although Paul has become quite fond of them, it will soon be time for them to move on. Well, they'll be here for another three or four weeks, um, and then they're going to be moving to the primate cage when that's all ready for them. And, uh, yeah, it would be nice to see them out there, and we'll pop by on our way round to do the rhinos down the woods and area down there, and have a look, see how they're getting on. Hopefully our babies down there, it'll be nice. We've almost come to the end of today's programme, but before we go, we've just got time to give one of the meerkats an end-of-day snack. He's here with keeper Rich Barnes. Come on, little one. What have you got there, Rich, to feed him? OK, just a, a, a box of bugs here. Oh, yeah. Can I, can I grab one, see yep. if they'll take it? Yeah. He's just come on, surfing behind. Ooh, Where crickets. are meerkats Delicious. from, Rich? OK, they're from the, uh, the Kalahari, um, which is, for those that don't know, in the, the south oh. of Africa. <laughs> oh, oh look at wolf that down. <laughs> and they're, they're famous for sort of standing guard, aren't they? Yeah, um, I mean, even, even sort of captive ones, they will... Um, yeah, they can be in captivity for 20 years and there'll still be one looking out for eagles and hawks. Yeah. Um, in the wild, uh, they can live in very large sort of mobs, up to 30 or 40 or whatever, and they'll always be at least three or four sort of on sentry duty, yeah. Excellent. Well, Rich, he's really enjoying these crickets. What else do meerkats eat in the wild? OK, um, in the wild, they'll eat a lot sort of um, more varied inverts rather than just crickets, um, sort of scorpions and locust and beetles and <laughs> grubs. Basically, anything they can get their hands on, um, they'll try anything once. If they don't like it, they'll spit it straight back out, but they'll um, forage and look around for the most stuff. He's a hungry little fella, isn't he? He's got these um, very distinctive <laughs> markings like sunglasses, you know. Um, are they for a particular purpose, do you think? Uh, well, obviously, being a ground dweller and looking up in the middle of the desert, you're going to look up and there's going to be a lot of sun, and to avoid getting sort of blinded by this every time they look up, and basically these black patches, this shade just uh, works a bit like sunshades, actually. And, um, so they are literally like protect, sunglasses? Yeah, it just literally protects their eyes. They're very clever. You right, little fella, come and have another cricket. Well, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. But there's going to be plenty more marvellous animals like the meerkats in the next Roar. In the wild, these vicious dogs are famous for eating their prey alive. But any day now, they could turn on each other. We'll find out why. It's feeding time for the tigers. Let's just hope that keeper Alan Keeling has remembered to shut the gate. And who's this demanding a handout? 